Mike Krieger, co-founder and CTO at Instagram. For the idea for Instagram, we started more with the goal that we wanted to accomplish versus the actual product. So if you went to our first company's website, which is bourbon.com, it was very basic, and it only had one sentence on there, and it said, a new way to communicate and share in the real world. So that was 2009, 2010, and even though that product didn't quite work, we knew that's what we wanted to pursue. If you kind of zoom back to that era, people were starting to have mobile phones readily available, the cameras were getting better, but everybody's photos were just getting stuck in their camera roll and they weren't going anywhere. So our idea was, let's help people communicate, let's help them share their stories by letting them kind of unleash those photos and start taking new ones um, and getting them to share them out to their friends and then eventually to the world. So it really came from that, seeing that opportunity, that moment in time and wanting to create that change in how people were uh, able to express themselves. The first idea we had was not quite the right one, which was more around location-based check-ins. If you remember, that was really popular in 2010, so we had our own take on it. And uh, that part of the product wasn't working so well. But what we heard from people all the time was the part of it where we let you upload photos next to your check-ins, they loved that. So what we did is we ripped out everything else about the product and we try to dig down and say, what are the big problems, what are the big opportunities around photos today? And we picked three. One was photos looked pretty ugly still. So if you remember the phone that you might have had at the time, it was amazing that it could take photos, but the photos weren't you know, exactly beautiful, especially compared to how much cameras have evolved today. So that's why we added the filters, was we wanted to close the gap between what you were perceiving and what you were capturing. Because sometimes you'd capture something that seemed very exciting in real life, and then you'd say, well, that's not quite how I remembered it. So trying to bridge that gap. The second problem was that it took a very long time to upload photos. So we did a bunch of work even early on around performance and optimization, such that it felt really instantaneous once you hit you know, go that the photo got uploaded. So that was the Insta part in the name. Um, and then finally, we learned that people at the time wanted to share across multiple networks. So there was Facebook, there was Twitter, there was Flickr, there was Tumblr. So we provided a one-stop one way in which you could post to Instagram, but also post um, and kind of syndicate beyond. So those three were the problems we identified. And the way we operated actually at the time, my co-founder Kevin and I, is we had a, a document that had those three problems and then a list of bullets around what we were working on. And if it didn't fit into one of those three, we basically said, no, we're not working on this for the first version. But on day one, we launched and we had 25,000 people sign up the first day and there was a tremendous amount of excitement. So even launch day was far beyond our expectations. And sure enough, we were inexperienced, had never built a big scalable backend system. So the first day was the, the moment of absolute joy of launching and seeing people get excited and then absolute despair when the site crashed and you couldn't load Instagram. And people were like, well, that was a, that was a nice idea, I'm gone. And it was terrifying that we would have had a moment in time and just squandered it by not having the infrastructure in place. Well, we worked really night and day for the next three days. We basically subsisted on a diet of uh, animal crackers, which you know had provided some sugar, some energy drinks, and a little bit of sleep whenever we could get it. And we basically moved from the hosting provider we were using over to Amazon Web Services, which a lot of start startups build themselves on. Um, and that migration process took about 36 hours of uninterrupted work, but once we were on, it was great because we were then established in a place where we could keep scaling the business because we never were able to predict, even in the first few years, how we'd grow. We'd hit a Valentine's Day and all of a sudden a new surge would happen. Justin Bieber would join and we'd have this moment where we're like, what? what's happening? Things are going crazy again. And we'd have these punctuated moments in time and the ability to respond dynamically was very important. The biggest challenge in the first few years was matching the crazy scale of growth that we were having to our own ability to grow our team. So we were very small at the time. We launched with just me and Kevin, two of us. Eventually we grew to six engineers, but that balance of fighting the fire that's happening now, preventing tomorrow's fire, and then building the next product was very difficult. So sometimes we'd bias towards working on new products and then we'd learn that we had to like run back and put out some things that were going on. But we just were felt very understaffed for all the challenges that we were facing at the time, by far our biggest challenge. It's funny being at Facebook because Facebook uses Facebook a fair amount in terms of its communication and we use all those tools internally at Instagram. So you know, you're getting Facebook messages, you have email coming in. The thing I found very helpful internally is we use Facebook groups for a lot of the coordination and basically in the morning I'll go through and read through all the updates from all the different teams. People say I have like an uncanny sense of what's going on at the company. It's purely because I spend that time to sort of kind of keep a pulse on everything that's going on. It kind of instantly changed things where imagine a very small cocoon of a company uh, now arriving in Menlo Park at a company that at the time was probably already two or three or plus, you know, several thousand people. And 
there was a lot of inbound interest from different teams. Hey, can we help? Hey, we have this new infrastructure. Do you want to adopt it? And part of the balance in the early days was kind of literally cocooning our team from all of the kind of inbound interest. So we settled down into a garage space that's in Facebook's headquarters, kind of closed the garage door and just tried to land and settle for the first few months. We try not to make too many big changes early on. And then we started creating the partnerships with their infrastructure team, their um, spam team to fight all the spam that could come up on Instagram, all these different partnerships that we were able to do. We were able to do kind of proactively, but first it's like deep breath, we've arrived. Let's settle in here and then now let's start having those conversations. I think one of the biggest changes that we had to make and adapt was in thinking about how we talk to the rest of the world. So, you know, one bump in the road that we had in that first year was we changed our terms of service. People were, you know, confused about what it meant, it kind of assumed that we were, had nefarious goals with their photos, which was really far from our intentions. And that was a lesson learned that even if we were part of a larger organization, it was really important for me and Kevin to stay at the forefront of communicating with our community. So the second that we got out in front of it and said, hey, here's our intentions, we've heard you, here's what we're changing based on your feedback, instantly it died down. And I mean, literally instantly, we could see the chart of people talking about it. And the second that blog post went up, it kind of calmed things down. And that's something to this day, every time we launch a product now, we'll do an Instagram Live to explain what it is. because. It is important that the founders are still there and we can have that direct interaction with the community. One of the biggest technical challenges we have these days is as we add capacity in terms of stories and live and direct, we still want to make our mobile apps best in class in terms of performance. So how quickly they start up, how quickly the scroll performance is, it's things that people have gotten to know Instagram for, for being smooth, they say. So how do we keep doing that even as we're extending the functionality of the product? So we started a team actually in New York um, that's core of the core client team, so the client apps. And their pure focus and all that they're measured on are how reliable is the app, how quick does it work, uh, how well does it work internationally, and even as we add capacity, can we still keep that sleekness and speed that Instagram has been known for. One of the biggest things I'm excited to develop on Instagram in terms of building that proximity between people is letting you feel even more close to the, the folks that you're, for example, watching a live from. So right now, you know, it's cool that you can go live, but as a viewer, it still feels like a relatively disconnected experience. And I had a, I had a moment the other day when I was watching a live and I started talking back to the person because you, know, you almost feel like it's a FaceTime call. So how can we let the viewers, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people simultaneously watching something, feel that connection back to the broadcaster and actually engage with them in some kind of, maybe it's not a verbal conversation, but I think it can involve far beyond what we have today where it's just comments that aren't always as real time as we'd like them to be, but all in, in, in service of making you feel like really you could be there. So that's one major area.